My name is Steve, and you're watching WTTW, your window to the world. See you pass that bus on the right. Okay. <laughs> Whoa! There you go. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. Oh, like a truck movie, smacking, smacking, whacking, whacking. Are you okay. left handed or right handed? I have no idea anymore. Oh, oh please, are very deep. Oh, can't you take the blood out of my back? <laughs> this is a second city where every night the best improvisers in the country are performing for packed houses. Since 1959, the Second City has been one of the most influential theaters in the country, turning out some of the world's most beloved actors. Right here in this theater, in the heart of Chicago, hundreds of artists have launched their careers, people who changed the face of television, film, and theater. Hi, I'm Jim Belushi, and I wrote and performed here, well, several years ago anyway. Tonight we're going to tell you something about this place, where we all began our careers. We're going to give you the first ever glimpse at the Second City show being created from the first day of rehearsal through opening night. You'll see how improvisation really works and how we use it to create comedy reviews. When we're done, you're going to see that when it comes to improvisation and comedy, this place is second to none. Chicago is, is part cow town, part sophisticated metropolis, and, and thus is incredibly unique uh, in that you've got Saul Bellow and Mike Ditka, and the combination of the two is what Second City is. Because Second City started with classical theater. All of us were classically trained. We were actors, we were directors, we were writers. Um, we were interested in, in classical structures. And we brought all of that knowledge to bear on the popular form. Okay, all right, here we go. Singles. One, two, three. Hike! No, no, no. On. Hike, you'll be right in there to get that ball. Come on. Come on, right up there. Right in contact. Right in contact. Drive in there. Come on, right up there. Come on, get that ball. Get that ball. Come on, get in there. Come on, get that ball. Get in there. Get that ball. What's the matter with you? What's wrong? I won't do it. Why not? Because I hardly know him. What emerged from that was, um, you know, a lot of stars, Edward Asner, uh, Barbara Harris, Alan Arkin, you know, right through to the John Belushi's, the Dan Aykroyd's, the Gilda Radner's, the uh, Chris Farley's, the Michael Myers, the Bonnie Hunt's. What we do on stage reflects what's happening in the world, right? And it changes constantly. If we were still doing Eisenhower jokes, nobody would come here, right? But the actors address are things that are happening around you. You know, Second City uh, uh, built itself uh, doing this classic review sketch comedy. Um, six chairs on an empty stage, uh, and the actors make it up. I write for a uh, nationally known magazine. What magazine? People. National Geographic. I, am, I uh, teach high school. What subject do I teach? Math. Geometry. Math. Okay, I have math. Math. Great. Question about anything, your life, politics, the world. Why is Macarena popular? Why is the Macarena popular? <laughs> Macarena was originated by penguins in the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Spread downward through the Bering Strait to where we now know it and do it at conferences today. Simple. <laughs> two parabolas, two right angles, and a sine curve, my friend. It's going to be a two-act show, roughly 40-minute acts. Uh, of mostly written material. After the show, uh, on most nights, we do a free improvisational set. It's the way we write our shows. Um, we have the great luxury of testing out our material in front of an audience, a uh, night after night, to hone it and craft it uh, and uh, uh, shape it uh, so that it can become part of the next review. When we start to uh, get on in the rehearsal process, we'll start throwing out some of the old scenes, throwing in some of the new scenes, and once the uh, 
new scenes overtake the old scenes. Uh, we slap a title on it, figure out an opening night, and there's your next Second City review. Nice haircut. Thank you. You like mine? <laughs> First, you've got your director, Mick Napier, um, who was uh, taught at Second City for some time and, and directed here previously, and an amazingly uh, gentle, sweet, vulgar human being, uh, someone I admire uh, on many different levels, not just their artistic talent, but also their humanity. I do remember the very first time I saw a show here, and it's odd, I'm sitting right in the spot where, I believe it was Mike Haggerty, was asking for suggestions in an improv set, and I, I think he was asking for occupations. And I was sitting right there, and I said, Cracker Salter, and he laughed, and I remember thinking, my God, I just made that guy laugh. And that was very romantic for me. And 10 years later, I'm directing it, which is romantic and frightening and wonderful. I'm also happy that, um, as a director, I have continued to perform because it helps me direct, it helps me direct so much and I'm, I come from their point of view. For I lend you help with this audio cassette manual. <laughs> the main stage cast of the Second City is in constant flux. For the most part, the cast is studying at the Second City's training center, travel across the country with the Second City's road companies, and then they perform at the Second City's ETC stage next door before being promoted, so to speak, here to the main stage. And because of the Second City's reputation. On any given night, the entertainment industry's heaviest hitters might be in the audience looking for new talent for television and films. It's mid-October as director Mick Napier begins the process of creating the newest Second City Review. It's a process that, believe it or not, can take three to five months. The current cast includes Scott Atzett, Kevin Dorff, Rachel Dratch, Tina Fey, Jenna Jolovitz, and Jim Zulovic. The model actor improviser for me, when I'm directing a show like this, organically developing material through improvisation and writing, is someone who will have the attitude of, sure, I'll try it. And then if it falls on its ass, they'll go, sure, I'll try it again. And someone who, on their, of their own accord, puts themselves at risk all the time. Someone who will boldly and fearlessly go into the unknown and see what happens. Kevin Dorff is a dream to work with. He'll try anything five times. He doesn't care if it falls flat every single time. He just goes, sure. Oh, I know what you're thinking, a kid in a bar, but he'd be well behaved. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't hit him. No, no, nothing like that. You know, when you love somebody, you don't, you don't hurt them. I mean, when you really love somebody, I mean like true love, not like lust like pornography, which I love. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, when that kid gets old enough to operate a VCR, his eyes are gonna pop right out of his head. Tina Fey, she's very, very smart. She's a very innocent, childlike quality about her that she knows, she knows how to deal with and gives her a lot of power on stage. All of her characters are so dimensional and fresh. She's constantly surprising me with stuff. You think I'm funny? You're funny. You think so? Scott Adsit is, <laughs> is very, very talented. He's confident enough to just lay back and play the scene, and usually that playing is accompanied by an extremely full-dimensional character. <laughs> Rachel is learning how to be more than just the most adorable woman on Earth, which she is. And She's making all these character choices that I would never expect from her. Yes, I'm writing a book on foreign policy called Don't Make Me Come Up There, China! <laughs> what I love the most about Jenna is sometimes when you get up on this stage, you decide that you know everything, you stop learning. You know, I'm, I'm on the main stage of Second City, I don't have to learn anything else. Now, Jenna, she's always asking about um, how she can grow, if she gets into any patterns, where she can break out what kind of characters uh, she could do to have herself appear differently. Very conscientious about that. And she's nice, sweet, heart of gold. What have you drawn there, Jenny? It's my family and they're on fire. <laughs> Jim Zulovic is the newest cast member for the show. He's like a, a lamb in rehearsals. So when he offers a suggestion, I listen because I know that it has value attached to it and I know he's not just talking for talking's sake. It's not like we are watching him it's as if he is watching us. He's mocking me! 
Improvisation among the best is not a 100% success rate anywhere. Uh, the best improvisers in the world probably get up to an 80%, 85% success rate. Success equaling uh, having a scene that builds and having a character that works and having the audience enjoy that, not necessarily laughing, but being empathetic to a process that's heightening in the scene. Improvising for a show is a very, it's a skill. Improvising in rehearsal, improvising without an audience is something to learn. Um, I think of it like dance or like a basketball team that's a good basketball team has practiced so much and knows each other so well that, that they know where they're going to be at any given time where they understand the rhythm of each player and, and they've worked uh, so long putting it together slowly that it's effortless or it seems effortless. You have to try to do as little editing as possible in your own head before you speak and, or, or move. There's no should have, there's always a could have. Uh, you should have said something more when you came in to measure yourself. You should have been someone's father or you should have been someone's boyfriend. You should have been some relation to somebody in the scene. But no, I could have and it might have gone a different way, but uh, you can't judge yourself like that. Otherwise, you're going to be not, not entering, you know? If your partner says something, then you agree to it and you add something to it. Like, if your partner says, take this bowling ball, and then you say, oh, that's not a bowling ball, that's a watermelon, then like, you'll get a laugh from the audience, but then the whole reality is gone. Like, if you just keep denying your partner, then the scene can't go anywhere. So you have to accept whatever your partner says as what the scene's about. Dad, Kevin mutilated my Barbies again! Kevin? She was getting in my G.I. Joe's face. <laughs> he broke her arm! G.I. Joe did it. <laughs> We're gonna have you talk to your counselor again. He's crazy, man. He was a nerve. <laughs> Make your partner look good, which is a kind of a well-worn phrase that we we trade with each other. It's a, it's a one that we got in class and when we got when we took, when we have our training and we use it all the time. I mean, we we say it sometimes, you know, to each other or you know, made me look good or that really made me look good or you know. Free <laughs> somnambulism. Man, I'm bored. <laughs> That's okay, it's soccer. <laughs> it's expected. It's too much beer, beer. I guess. Beer. Oh, finally. Oh, it's don't wake him up. Don't wake him up. Beer. Beer. Darwinism. And guys like that won't last long. No. <laughs> I knew of a man in touring company who literally used to count his laughs while on stage. He came from a stand-up background. I'm not knocking stand-ups, but I guess I am. Came from a stand-up background. And uh, yeah, he would keep a tally. He was fired because they're not getting it, you know? You can be the funny straight man. You can get laughs as a straight man. You can serve your fellow player by not playing a part that gets the laughs. You see, in the United States, what we try to stress through our educational system... Well, the point is, General, it's difficult for us to open... I'm sorry, do you often allow a woman to interrupt you? <laughs> no. No, um, gee, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, you, you may speak. This is the first cast that's ever been three men and three women. It's not, once again, like straight theater where, well, our company is fewer women because the plays are that way. We can write whatever we want and we can play whoever we want. So there's no reason why it can't be three men, three women, you know, three dogs and a, you know, a chicken. It can be anything because we can write whatever comes out of those people. So I think it's great that we're three and three for the first time. I mean, this is a little more loose, but you're not supposed to ask questions because if you ask questions, you're putting it all on your partner. Like if you say, um, so why are we here? <laughs> like, um, what, what time are we leaving? When you could just say like, um, listen, we're here because we've got a big meeting. Then you're adding something. Or if you say, um, we've got to leave now. The taxi's outside. Then you provide something for your partner. I can't live here anymore. Nothing gets clean. <laughs> final thing you really have to know is how to release all your inhibitions and all your self-judgment and all your judgment of the other people so that you can just be in that situation and respond and, and 
uh, you know, a lot of times it's just whatever, uh, whatever natural response you have gets a laugh because people recognize themselves in it. to them in real life, they bring back here and put on stage all the time. Uh, it's incredibly vulnerable. It's probably the one thing I admire most in the actor. This is the revolution that happened 30 years ago. The idea that you could go to a theater and tell them what to do, and they'll do it. All of these performers, including the director, Mick Napier, have been taking classes and performing for years. They've been learning these philosophies and using them to refine the craft of improvisation. Making it to the Second City main stage is like making the big leagues. It takes more than talent to get here. It takes lots of patience, dedication. And that's what brings them together today to start work on a new review. Welcome. Welcome to the very first day of rehearsal. The yeah, let's get on stage. Good. Mick will just say, two people, go, go, like just whatever, minute long scenes over and over, and he'll write down all the scenes. And then if anything sort of hit or struck him, then he'll say, well, I kind of like that. Do you want to work on that? Each of you do five little scenes, four to six scenes. And the way to do that is consecutively. So if Rachel were to begin, she would stay out here and everyone would join her for five scenes in a row. Mm -hmm. Different people would join her. Okay. Get it? Five different scenes. I'm going to give you your first line of dialogue. <laughs> what, do, you want, do you want a specific thing different every time? Here's all I want you to do is jump on the line. That's it. Jump on the line. Don't think, I don't, I don't want you to think about having to make it different or anything. Oh, just is this the same thing it. then? With just, but one person's like, the line, line, last line, first line, last line. For example, thing? if Rachel were doing this, it would be, um, honey, here's the bread. Go. It's a yo-yo, damn it. Go. It's a yo-yo, damn it. We are in the middle of a business meeting. <sighs> Listen, I'm trying to quit smoking. It's all I have. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I found it and I ate it. Go. I found it and I ate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is it giving you trouble now? Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's get your next one right here. <laughs> I found it. <laughs> I ain't it. Uh, I'll try to determine what it is. Right over this way. All right? Stand right in front of this. Yeah. Put your chin up there. Okay. Rest your chin on that. Mm, I found it. And, and I ate it. Ain't it. <laughs> yeah. Let's say, for example, if you have someone and they are in a pattern of every time they come on stage, they talk a lot. Right? And they use their hands a lot. If I provide the first line of, my hands are behind my back for a reason, and I'm not speaking to you, then that provides them the opportunity to go in the direction that would not have occurred to them. You're a miracle. I love you. Go. You're a miracle. I love you. I mean, I really love you. And I don't think, nothing's fun with other people now, you know? It's just like, I, I can only think of you when I'm like, you know, if I'm driving or if I'm like in the middle of, of shaving, I, I just say your name and stuff, you know? <laughs> Bonnie. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> you, you know, I, I'm on the fourth floor across the street. So, um, what is it that you do for a living? Me? Um, well, I, uh, I catalog uh, bugs. <laughs> for for the people. museum? Well, you know, it's, it's just really, really I'm kind of freelancing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm wicked. Go. All right, I'm wicked, right? You're the one that's wicked. I'm serious. <laughs> you come in here, you all look it up, and you want me to drive you down to... Ma! I just need a ride, all right? You want me to drive you down to the mall parking lot so you can meet boys? I don't think so. Why not? You used to do that. I used You're to... You're down at the mall parking lot every night! That is different. That is put 
putting you through school. <laughs> <laughs> now, no one counts on coming up with material that will make it into the review on the first day of rehearsal. But the scene known as Wicked seemed to show a lot of promise. So, a couple of weeks later, Tina and Rachel used the audience's suggestion of condoms to improvise a scene using their wicked characters. Darlene, I gotta talk to you because I was driving home from work the other day and I saw you parked in a car making out with a boy. Oh my God. Oh my God, no way. <laughs> oh my God. I saw you. Oh my, oh and my God. And you had your top off, Darlene. No, no. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God, that was a secluded area. Darlene, it was a Popeye's chicken. <laughs> Popeye, you made your case, but I need to talk to you because I don't want you getting pregnant. I'm not gonna get pregnant. That's what I said. <laughs> and then boom, I'm 16, I'm pregnant, and two years later, I gotta marry your father. <laughs> Listen, I am wicked sorry for whatever you had to go through. Well, I hope so. I am different from you, I am not like you, Ma. No, you're not like me. You know what you're like? You're like your goddamn father. You got your oh my God, your father, please the hairy father, the beady little eyes of your goddamn father. <laughs> you smell like your father. The only reason why I smell like my father is because you won't let me wear perfume and I have to wear Old Spice. <laughs> Well, I'm well, pretty excited about that Boston scene, and I think we'll get that in that scene with me and Rachel. Me too. Because it's also just silly and fun. Wicked is working well. I like that. It's a really nice scene. I'm glad there's a scene with two women um, in it that really are not centered on either reaction to men or um, issues that are only of women. Now, it's only $14.99 for one set of photos. You're under no obligation to purchase for other photos. Heather, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but you're not a model. And you don't need a model portfolio. No, you are wicked putting me down right now. You are giving me a negative body image. By improvising in rehearsals and in sets, the cast refines Wicked to the point where it can live as a complete scene. Hey, Matt, can we stop having friendlies on the way home? I got a wicked craving for a cribble. Jesus Christ, Heather, you just said 10 pieces of cheese at Hickory Farm. Matt, you're going to give me a negative body image, all right? Seriously, seven out of ten teenage girls have a negative body image. Yeah, well, six of them girls are right. <laughs> While scenes like Wicked emerge from spontaneous improvisation and rehearsal, other scenes are created when cast members think of ideas on their own. The group can then use those ideas to improvise in a set. You know why this lobby is painted orange? Because it was painted in the 70s. <laughs> because orange is known to be a calming color. Yeah, I like to come down here. I prefer it down here. I love it down here in the lobby. I don't like being up in my room too much, you know? Well, what color's your room? Fire engine red. <laughs> the rooms up there are red? <laughs> no, my room's red. You paint your room red? <laughs> well, yeah, I got a little silly one there. <laughs> Why'd you paint uh, it red? I don't know. I woke up and shocked the hell out of me. <laughs> I like when you fold a towel. <laughs> there it is. Oh, no. Yeah, I like when you go for the ones at the bottom there. <laughs> yeah, I want to I wanna tell you I appreciate you never hitting on me. Oh. Well, I'll tell you, it takes everything I got. <laughs> In another set, working off the suggestion of stripper, Kevin comes up with a very funny line that will be the launching point for a scene in the new review. I'm only in town for one night. Let's go. Ah, <laughs> uh, we're having music, so you just have to strip to CNN. <laughs> now, and then CNN stripper. I liked that scene. I did too. What does one do with that? Anything? Put it up as a scene. Through the course of improvising the scene, once again, Scott and Tina come up yes. with an interesting take yes. Yes. on these new characters. Ow! You married? A little bit. <laughs> What's your wife like? Oh. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, you know what? I'll tell you what she's like. 
Probably very nice, probably very pretty, right? Keeps yourself nice and thin, right? Frosty blonde hair, yeah? Bachelor's degree, shops at Old Orchard, right? <laughs> Essentially. You make me so grossed out. You are a disgusting little worm. I swear to God, I can't believe that you have a wife and you called a stripper. That's so nasty. I'll tell you something, I have more pride and dignity than you ever will, all right? <laughs> really funny. Mm. Uh, while, while you're doing this, you start like if you're cheating this way, your tea's right in front of you. If you, uh, if you go like a, you know, just state the biggest story of that day. Oh, so that. Oh. Hmm. Kevorkian's before the Supreme Court. <laughs> nice. It'll be funny. I don't know where I put it. Can you see my five positions, mother? One, two, three, four, five. Don't ever question me. I'm a dancer. <laughs> Now, rather than let YMCA and Stripper exist separately, which might give too much weight to the scenes featuring Scott and Tina, Mick guides them into creating one integrated scene. No, you know, you're a smart woman. I appreciate you. You know, no, I mean that. You, you're too smart for working at a YMCA. Oh, okay, here we go. Broken record, William. You gotta get out of here, you know? You gotta follow your dream, what's inside your heart. And it's not being a clerk, you know that. Everybody's gotta do that. My daughter, is a professional dancer. You call for a dancer? I call for a stripper. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Great. All right, let's get this show on the road. First thing you need to know is I'm not a prostitute. Please do not solicit me for prostitution. I'm a professional dancer. I'm a trained dancer. I'm not a hooker, right, okay? let's get to that when we get to it, all right? <laughs> you got a tape player in here for oh, me? I didn't think of that. No, um, you didn't think about that, right? Because you don't care about the dance aspect of this. You just want to see a little bit of this and a little bit of that, right? Open to it. make me sick. <laughs> all right, there you go. Great, so I will now strip to CNN for your sexual pleasure. <laughs> Reworking scenes like these happens throughout the rehearsal process. For example, the first version of the scene called Driving Instructor begins as a series of short scenes that recur throughout a set. It's, uh, it's a sausage biscuit. No, I'd like to see you eat it while you're driving. What? Eat it while you drive. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, uh, let's uh, pretend you're a little late for work. Speed up. <laughs> Whoa. Very good. My hands are really slippery now. <laughs> wipe, them on the, wipe them on the chair. That's right. Where'd the wrapper go? Oh. <laughs> All right. Now well, there's an accident over there. What are you going to do? Look. <laughs> Look. Right. Slow down and look. Remember the law. <laughs> All right. Let's see how you are with makeup. <laughs> You're good. You're good. <laughs> you have the option of stopping in the middle of traffic if you like. <laughs> By opening night, elements of all three scenes have been distilled into one. All right, Scott. Well, let me see you apply this makeup while you drive. I don't really wear makeup. I'm sorry, there's no gender bias allowed on this test. Good. Very good. The look of a scene on stage can be just as important as its content. If it looks awkward, no matter how funny it is, it may play awkwardly too. This was the case with a scene called Country. The worst part about it is that the new company, the guys who are buying this out, they want the whole division to go country. Go country? Yeah. We sell copier equipment. What the hell does that mean? Country. Do they know what we do? God bless. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Tanya Lene Jeff from Roker and Brown. This is my assistant, Helen Lefkowitz. Oh, hiya. Just wanted to come down and say hello and welcome aboard. Hi, I'm Jim Zillebeck. Hi, Jim. Nice to meet you. Kevin Dorf. Hi, Kevin. Howdy. And howdy to you, too. OK. All right, the entire time, I'm racking my brain to figure out what to do with you guys. This is just standing in a line.
Oh, oh, oh. That's it. What it is? That was it. Good eye, Anton. I almost walked right over it. This is the first version. This thing is gonna snap my pelvis. Tingle me and look at you! I'm a steer! <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I'm not so sure if my two favorite Daniels are Charlie and Jack. Mine are! <laughs> That's great. <laughs> now, well, you see, Tanya, our company motto has always been quality copier equipment at an affordable price. Not born on a mountain, lived in a cave, trucking and f***ing is all I crave. <laughs> say that to a client. Kevin, Kevin, as a former Miss Tennessee, there's two things I know. One of them is that the children are our future, and the other is that people respond to friendliness, and that is why a friendly company is a successful company. Yee-haw. Well, you know Did you sign my time sheet? Oh, come on. She is a temp. We shouldn't put her through this. <laughs> Darling, your head's on backwards. <laughs> she looks ridiculous. Oh, come on now. I think she just looks as pretty as a five-legged frog hopping around an old hollow deer. These are not the final versions of anything. Nothing's final. Even after opening, for that matter. I mean, it's going to change after opening, for that matter. Nothing is ever final. <laughs> at the second city. Now, all this may seem pretty easy, but it's much harder than it looks. All improvisers have their share of off nights. And even with the most receptive and supportive audiences, some improvisational sets fall completely flat. What do you guys need? A line of dialogue? Any line of dialogue at all? Something you said to somebody today. I love applesauce. I love applesauce, baby. I love applesauce. I have a big tub of it right here. <laughs> oh, my God. Ugh. I have the world's biggest latke over in the <laughs> closet. Mm. Look at that. I fried well. it up this morning. These go quite well together, don't they? I bet they do. Let me get a spoon. It's a little more brown on the one side than on the other. Come on in! I got the pork chop! Ah, yeah, keep it coming. You know, improvisation, with the best improvisers in the world, and it's got about 75% hit rate, you know? And if the 25% of the time it doesn't work, happens all in one night, then you get this set. I just killed somebody! I just killed somebody! Not again! Yes, I did it again! Oh. Careless princess. I know. I, I'm we're so very stupid. disappointed with you. The problem is that you know we're in a groove and we're stuck in it. Sometimes you force some energy, but then it's fake. That's like I tried to force one. I was like, I just killed somebody. I was like trying to yeah. force something. But then, and of course, and what did we do when she did that? Stood there. <laughs> we didn't match your energy. We didn't grab onto your emotion. We just went, oh boy, that's terrible. You know, if, if we had actually responded. We could have, you know, hidden you, shielded you from the police, put you in the trunk, driven somewhere fast and energy, and, and it would have changed some things. A director, I feel like, needs to be someone who everyone feels confident will pull it off. I believe that, because I've been in many shows, and I believe that, that if you're an actor in a show, that you want to feel like your director is going to take care of it. It's fine. In the end, it'll be fine. And some directors might say the words, I don't know, like this. I, I don't know. And that would be frightening. Another director might go, I don't know. Another one might go, I don't know. And for me, the, the how and the way of those words uh, is the world 
because one is, I don't know, but I will, don't worry. Another one is, I don't know, and I never will, and I'm frightened. Mick's job is hard, I think, because he can only work with what he, we give him. He's got to help us come up with the overriding concept and what does he want to see in terms of, yeah, gonna, of the, the stuff that fills in the scenes, you know? He's got to be like head writer, editor, mm -hmm. director, Set acting designer. coach, Excellent. you know. Yeah, yeah just like acting coach. Psychologist, yes. <laughs> uh, like group dynamics manager. Yes. Jim had a character that was real ass. Oh, a life uh, as a result of me giving each of the actors something challenging for them to do on stage, which I later found out that isn't real challenging for Jim, and he did it very well. So Jenna came up with the idea of having her blood going into Jim's body to save him, and Jim is inconsiderate about it. What happened was that Jenna created a very endearing character, a character that the audience empathized with because she's playing the fear of, fear of being poked with a needle. So now you've got an audience loving a character that another character comes in and abuses. And we don't want to see this woman being abused. I don't know how Jim's going to feel about being completely cut out of that scene. He's a nice character. Mm -hmm. yeah, he deserves what if he's not cut out of the scene? Oh, tie me off! Tie me off! Tie me off! Tie me off! Can you make a place for me? I really don't want to make a place for me. Make a fist! I may hit you! Make a fist! 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 Make a
making the cast will try to create a context for the scenes, a link that the audience will understand and appreciate. I think we have a uh, great opportunity here. We're two weeks from opening the show, and I think we have a damn good chance of making it one of the coolest shows that's been in a while. There's such a weird spastic energy right now, which any given day, depending on what you're working on, what your focus is on, can either be awful or good, you know? May I present an idea also? Because I do have another idea, and that is this. That at the top of the show, what the audience would see, this involves your character uh, in blood, believe it or not. Your character is not awake, like coma ridden or whatever. And the question that would be raised is what goes on while someone is under the, in that state. Concurrent to that, we show flashes of, if, of uh, images we'll see in the show different colors, different ways of lighting it. Through that, what we get is, these are images that are in your mind in coma. It doesn't begin with this, but either in his song or speaking, saying something about life and about living life, and so it's comedic that he's actually in a coma. Start with a funny image. And the last line of the, of the I was just about to say that actually, about yeah. being a very happy song, the last line of the song is, um, but I'm in a coma. Yeah. Fun. That's fun. Yeah, it's that's funny. funny. How's it going? <laughs> Well, I wrote two verses, but because I don't think it can stand much more. It's another terrific day, a day that's mine for the taking. It's another fantastic day. You best believe there's no mistaking that the world is my oyster with a mess of goo inside. I've got the thingy to crack it open, and I can eat it raw or fried. Or fried. It's another stupendous day. And I don't want to sound redundant, but it's another stupendous day. <laughs> to waste it would be repugnant. There's so much life to live. I'm going to go supernova, and I'd grab it all today if I weren't in a coma. <laughs> What's going on in that head of yours? What's going on in there? I feel like how everyone feels the week before the show, like, I'm glad it's coming to a close, and it seems like everything's falling together. I still want to see what it looks like to build out in images to get to curtain call. I want to see if it's too f***ing pretentious or whether it's effective or whatever. There was something great about that last night, um, late at night. I was thinking about it afterwards, how much I'm going to miss that. The light people working around us, working in the lights, and us working, and everybody working on different parts of this theater, and making this theater, like, everyone's staying late. Uh, people who aren't paid, you know, excessively, but passionate about getting it done, and we're working on the ending of the show, and the pressure, and putting it all, you know, putting it all in place was just really exciting to me. The opening of a new Second City Review is a major event in Chicago. It's a chance to witness the cutting edge of comedy and improvisation. It's exciting for the audience. But behind the scenes, it can be a little uh, stressful. The opening nights are, are uh, you know, dreadful a lot of the time uh, for me, and I, th and I think for everyone, uh, in the cast until they're over. The experience is very, you're, you're nervous, you are on edge, uh, you're trying to make sure, you know, everyone's in their place at the right time. You know, you get real snappy uh, and, and uh, snippy with people. And uh, all the time you've got to put on your face, you know, for the critics and for friends and family. And, you know, everyone's going, oh, how are you doing? How's the show look? That sort of thing. And then people try to talk to you about the show at intermission. How do you think it's going? OK, don't talk to me. I don't know how it's going. Well, it's another stupendous day. And I hate to be redundant, but it's another stupendous day. Beauty is so abundant. I want to grab life with both hands. I want to breathe in its aroma, and I do it all today. But I'm in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> we got a kowtow to the changing economic trends. We're country now. So what? Big deal. Next year will be something else. No way over my dead body. Fellers, I got some bad news. What's up, Slim? <laughs> the company's getting a bought out. Are they thinking of downsizing us? <laughs> I think it's worse than that. 
From what I hear, the new parent company is thinking about maybe making our whole division go German industrial. <laughs> I have disturbing news. <laughs> Everything is disturbing. <laughs> Are they going to downsize us? Bee beard. Bee beard. <laughs> First thing that. From what I hear, the new parent company wants our entire division to go Amish. <laughs> Have ye heard the rumors of the bio? What sayest thou? Are they going to downsize us? <laughs> Worse than that, Mordecai. From what I understand, the new parent company wants our entire division to go Italian runway model. <laughs> Reminded me I'm late for an appointment. A brief photo opportunity. I must preside over the torture of some political prisoners. She will entertain you in my absence. Sure, someone would do it for you. Fisher Price people don't have any feet. <laughs> this is their vacation camper. <laughs> Hey, the 
I just don't want you getting pregnant. Matt, what is this, a very special blossom? <laughs> <laughs> you know what your problem is, Heather? You're exactly like your father. Oh my God, attention shoppers, here comes my purse. Well, and on, huh? it on. <laughs> Listen to me, you look like your father, you talk like your father, you smell like your goddamn father half the, the time. The only reason I smell like my father is because you won't let me wear perfume and I gotta wear Old Spice. Well, God forbid you just don't wear any perfume, you little hoochie mama. Ah, I'm sorry. No, I'm not, Heather. You drive me up a freaking you, boy. I swear uh, to God, Heather. It's my right job now. to you piss you off. I'm your you mother. I'm your 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 Just the temptation to give notes, but it was okay. Because <laughs> all I was thinking was, uh, uh. But I spent most of my time in the uh, in the bar. My mother's birthday was today, so I called her right after it opened. It's the first chance I've had to call her. And it was a good show, though. It went well. It went very well. I'm tired, delirious, and happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruby. Well, thank you. I don't need to be gross, Kelly. It was uh, it was brilliant, and uh, you made it a real pleasure. I'm just uh, I'm out of adjectives, so I wish you uh, nothing but good luck, uh, continuing success for the season. You made it a real joy. I came here kind of grudgingly. I had a hunch, but I was uh, I was blown away. Your only problem tonight, and a little piece of advice: you put the water line too high. I, say I don't think this has ever happened. <laughs> I know. I have never seen this ever happen. happen. <laughs> Who's covering my parking? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, pal. It's never happened. A critic actually walks right out. I have never seen that happen. I have never seen that happen. I love you in the tree. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to walk backstage after an opening and you know, be able to honestly give everyone a hug and a toast and say, you guys did great. Well, that's it. That's how the Second City does it. Walk into rehearsal on day one with nothing, and within a few months, premiere a new review. Paradigm Lost earned raves from the critics. It won awards for its cast who were invited to the Aspen Comedy Festival to perform the show. The review was a crowning achievement for the Second City and for the people who created it. But of course, nothing lasts forever. I've been up there a year and a half. But, uh, yeah, you can't, you know, make this your life career. The fact that it can be a springboard is like a nice frosting. Um, but it's not, it's not that important for me to get through here as quickly as possible, to get to this sitcom, you know? I mean, you know what, the thing is, that stuff's down the line, hopefully, maybe, probably, but uh, that can wait. I'm not making as much money here, but having a lot of fun. I think I'm probably now the happiest I will be in my life, although I hope that's not true. I hope, you know, things get better, but uh, I'm an actor who performs in front of 300 people every night. Uh, I write my own material and uh, perform by the seat of my pants. I was very relieved. I was very happy. I was partly sad because it was over. <laughs> And uh, and I knew I hadn't done it th the best way I could have. Us enjoying ourselves, whether we're in rehearsal, whether we're doing a set, or whether we're performing a written scene, us enjoying ourselves will be evident to the audience, and that is the key to them enjoying themselves. Well, I've only done two of these now, but now that this one's done, I can honestly see how people say, I don't know how many of these I can do, because even though this was almost a, a perfect experience and everything, you know, with great director, great cast. It's, it's so, it is hard to work an ensemble. It's, 
It's hard to work by committee. It's hard. It's draining. I'm still amazed that I'm sitting here right now talking about a show I directed at the Second City main stage. So when I was in college and read Something Wonderful Right Away by Jeff Sweet, that got me into improv, and then I got a group together. And that's when I started learning about a place called Second City. And Lord, just the scope that it has, and to watch people come in here, look at the walls, look at all the people who've been here. And the last thought that would have been on my mind 10 years ago is that I would ever, A, be a director, B, be direct this main stage at Second City. You're getting them young in their career. You're getting them where they're focused on the work, uh, where what they care about is the work. They're not interested in the money or the prestige or any of that. They're simply here to do the best work that they can, and they really care about stuff. And that is so rare. And, you know, we're so lucky to be in Chicago in a place that can support that. This is 11.